Thanks so much. It's uh, really thrilling to be here, especially uh, under these auspices. And it's great to see Judy here and representatives of the Becker family. He was really important to me. And that's why this is really a, a talk in debt to him, as you'll hear right away. So no images, just words. There's no avoiding it. Uh, this occasion forces me to confess my sins against my fathers. I have three fathers that I recognize. My mother told me more than once that she thought Sam looked a bit like my dad. I should have had the PowerPoint. Um, he stood in loco parentis by taking me in and then actively helping me avoid the draft of uh, being drafted for Vietnam. <clears throat> Only la later did I learn of his uh, military exploits, harrowing ones. Sam was born in 1923, three years after my own father, and just five years after Andre Bazan, who's the third man in this generation of people who formed me. In fact, I came to Iowa as a refugee from the Columbia strike of 1968, and I was being hounded by the draft board. I can claim to be the first doctoral candidate that was ever admitted uh, above Sam's signature as chair because he took over the department in 68, and I showed up. I had a a fellowship which traveled with me, and I just wrote and said, I'd like to come here. <laughs> I've never been to Iowa, but I need a place, <laughs> and I've got the money, <laughs> and here's what I do. And uh, he said, come. And that was in June, and I came uh, a month later. I was determined, I knew something about the department, and I was determined to bend uh, speech and dramatic art, as it was called then, towards cinematic art because I knew that there was a tradition of aesthetics here. There was David Knopf and Aki Brownstein, with whom I worked a bit in the first year. Uh, and then there was Sam's student, and who became his good friend, and his, remains my friend, Ted Perry, who had just finished a dissertation on Michelangelo Antonioni's film Eclipse, arguing that it was a completely self-enclosed object answering only to itself as part of the Chicago so-called contextualist school. Uh, of the criticism at the time. And I was deeply involved in Antonioni and reading about criticism. Uh, and I couldn't believe, well, in fact, what happened was that uh, the writing about, writing a whole dissertation on a single film was so uncommon that I learned about this while I was on the barricades at Columbia reading the New York Times. And there was a little, little blurb, a, a curio uh, in the Times saying, man writes dissertation on single film. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And, I, and then it said, on Eclipse, and I had just published my first essay I'd ever published. It had come out on Antonioni, and I had written about Eclipse. I said, whoa, I want to go there. Um, well, I was even more single-minded uh, about, uh, about film art than even Ted Perry. And when I got here, I chafed at the courses that I was obliged to take in persuasion and in other subjects that were in this, the speech part of speech and dramatic art. And so... Uh, I was, it was rather arrogant, but I just, I leapt over, I left, I left the department and went over to the English department and completed my doctorate there in the modern letter, le letters track. Sam didn't begrudge this at all. In fact, he immediately hired me to teach in, in his department. I had an MFA, which was considered a terminal degree, and Ted Perry had left, and I had the highest reigning degree in Iowa City in film, and they had students, so he asked me to come back and teach. And I did it for the next 30 years then during which time he and I t tussled over art versus persuasion. Well, of course, persuasion wins such tussles by definition. So uh, I was single-minded, and he was many-minded, as we've heard so much about him this weekend. I'm afraid I remain single-minded. Perversely, as you'll hear in a second, I've always had it in for communication, the word, the notion, even the discipline. <laughs> uh, but I've been single-minded in another way, too, not perverse at all. Because I arrived at Iowa carrying a book which was hot off the press in 1968, the English translation of Andre Bazin's What is Cinema? Now here was aesthetics at its richest. I would write my dissertation on Bazin, producing it swiftly not just because the draft board was still hovering, but because Sam had had me teach the major film theories each year where Bazin formed the cornerstone. This was the best course, course I taught at the time, and Sam really appreciated it, even though uh, he knew my aim was to turn students away from communication and towards something quite impractical. I still marvel that such a pragmatist could encourage me and Franklin Miller, because we effectively came as a pair, uh, to explore the truly useless uses of film. I recall throwing down the gauntlet dramatically at one faculty meeting, <clears throat> and I bellowed out the catchphrase, this was later, this was in the 80s, I bellowed out the catchphrase that I had just read in Gilles Deleuze, something like, communication is the inverse of expression. <laughs> <laughs> 
The more one communicates, the less one deeply expresses, and the more one emits one's feelings, the less information gets across. And that was a Deleuze's theory. It's a famous, actually, rephrase of, probably goes back to I.A. Richards, doesn't it? Now that I think of it, just by bellowing this, I was giving an example of my point, because the point was deeply felt, but it wasn't understood on the other side of the table. I trust you understand what I mean here, because I'm communicating now when I say that I was devoted to the incommunicable, to the sublimely expressive, to ineffable films such as Mizuguchi's Ugetsu Monogatari, whose title in English is The Tale of the Hazy Moon After Rainfall. This was what I was working on. Meanwhile, Franklin Miller was making experimental films that were like visual cones. We didn't think of film, that film communicated anything important. Instead, it explored the unknowable in the world, in us, and in itself. So this belligerent rhetoric, bellowing, let's say, was part of the era. Michael McGee once screamed at me in Sam's presence, don't talk to me about aesthetics. I had my aesthetics snipped off at birth. <laughs> well, McGee and I fought like estranged brothers, except in our mutual devotion to Kenneth Burke. Sam was our father. He was father of the department and of a field, really, in our view. And as Freud tells us, that merited him both our devotion uh, a rivalry between ourselves and some hostility. Of course, I had even greater fails of failures of communication with my own father and probably greater hostility, especially in the era of the counterculture. But he was, a, he was an electrical engineer who was, in fact, a communications expert. Had I even glanced at his work, most of, it, most of which was classified, I would have seen the rapport between what he was doing then and what I stand for now. Both of us cared about using technology to probe the universe. In the little manifesto that, uh, that was just mentioned that I published recently in homage to Bazan, bearing the title, ironically, What Cinema Is, with an exclamation point, I argue that cinema's primary value comes in the mode of discovery. All its other values are minor in comparisons because entertainment, persuasion, and transmission of ideas are common to all media. But cinema probes the night sky of the audiovisual universe and brings us inhuman communication, information that from things that we would otherwise not be aware of in the same way without its technological sensors. Now, my father was, in fact, in charge of the, of the communication system on the Mariner 4 space probe, the mission that first gave us pictures of Mars in 1965. And I remember him driving to Caltech's Jet Propulsion Laboratory to watch those pictures slowly fill in. Although the Earth is just uh, well, 12 to 15 minutes away from Mars by a speed of light, it took four days for the three-watt transmitter to release at eight pits, bits per second, the 20 pictures that the Mariner had captured and stored on its four-track tape recorder. Things were really primitive. A three-watt transmitter. Well, eight pixels a second meant it took eight hours to fill in the 200 lines of a single highly pixelated image. 40,000 pixels, in fact, for any image. I would call this really probing at the, at the basis. This is discovering. This is registering the unknown. This, in fact, is the mode of cinema, as far as I can tell. I wouldn't consider it communication, or I wouldn't consider it television. I don't know what Sam would have said, but I never asked him. That's why I'm, that was my mistake. This is my miscommunication with him. I should have talked about such things with him. Today I realize uh, that at the time of my first memories, I was five in 1950, all three of my fathers were forging their careers alongside television. I remember the small, fuzzy, round screen that my father had put together that year in 1950. We were all amazed, whether we were 35 years old or five. Maybe I watched a program that had originated from the old Armory's television center, where, in fact, I first met Sam, shook hands with him in 1968, because he had worked in that center in the 1950s and ran it for years. Actually, I don't think they produced very much for, uh, for broadcast, but it was, a, it was a major source of income for the department. That's why it grew so well. Uh, so all three of my fathers were consumed by television in the 50s, professionally consumed by it. My father, the electrical engineer, Sam, the producer and t uh, teacher, and as you're about to hear, Andre Bazan, the critic. Meanwhile, I simply consumed it, like every kid, until I petulantly stopped consuming it. I gave it up for cinema when I learned how to drive and could head to the art theaters in Los Angeles. And that was right at the beginning of the new wave period in France. And then I went to, co uh, to college where there was no TV, uh, but there was a thriving cine club. 
So I've been a snob about this ever since, I, I, I must admit. Uh, and I, I stood alongside Jean-Luc Godard, figuratively that is, when he said, you look up to cinema, you look down on TV. <laughs> so this is my sin, to stand sanctimoniously against both television and communication. And this talk really is my confession. Maybe it's the result of a certain penance. Last year, finally shocked into recognizing the extent of our new media environment, I determined to examine what Bazin might have said about the new media in his environment in the early 50s. Because I had acquired and organized, um, though not read yet, all of his writings, still haven't read it all, some 2,600 uncollected pieces. It turned out he watched a lot of television, watched and wrote about it regularly. He got a TV when he was recovering from tu tuberculosis in 1950. This is a year after ORTF started daily broadcasts. And he was watching it right up to the end because it seems he sent an article about TV the day before he passed away in 1958. How did Bazan come to terms with all the threats and changes to cinema that arose just as he started the journal that he is most associated with, Cahiers du Cinema, 1951? He's the patron saint of cinephilia, an organizer of film clubs, the man behind the auteur theory that came to dominate Cahiers and that raised the prestige of cinema as art. But in fact, anybody who looks closely could tell he was a born cultural critic as much as an aesthetician. He was ever intent to clarify the most prominent or fascinating phenomena around him. I see Garrett Stewart here, and Garrett and I shared a student some years ago, uh, James Tweedy, who's now teaching at the University of Washington, and he wrote an essay in the opening Bazan volume called Andre Bazan's Bad Taste, uh, in which he talked about him as a cultural critic. After World War II, cinema, however, in terms of cultural criticism, cinema would have been what you looked at because it was unquestionably the most prominent and fascinating of all expressions, the era's most crucial and sophisticated cultural manifestation. As daily film critic for France's largest circulating newspaper, La Parisienne Libre, and as regular contributor to Les Grands Français, the popular weekly for real film lovers, that had been born in the resistance, his job and his pleasure was to raise the level of discussion about what was playing in Paris's more than 300 theaters. Thanks to his legendary curiosity and extremely broad educational background in sciences and theology and philosophy and literature, he took every opportunity to instruct himself and his readers on topics that any given film or that the cinema as a whole might bring up, whether it be technology or science or art history. These opportunities came far more frequently after 1950 when he was recruited to write regularly for two periodicals that were just then being launched and that are exceedingly popular up to this day. The first is Radio Cinema Television, which is now Telerama, which has about a half a million subscribers to it. It's where you learn what's on TV and in the movie theaters. And the second uh, is La Nouvelle Observateur. And in the title of the first one, Radio Cinema Tele uh, Television, cinema is kind of sandwiched between its two rival media. Le Nouvel Observateur, on the other hand, is a wide-ranging cultural magazine with the visibility of Newsweek, but the sophistication of the new, new Republic, except it's much more even to the left of that. Today, I guess the Huffington Post might be as close as you could get to its stance and coverage. Readers expected extended film reviews from Bazan, but also short articles on trends in the entertainment industry. His first pieces for each of these two journals appeared in September of 1950, when his convalescence presented him the opportunity to assess cinema among all the arts and to analyze its uh, response to the technological crises of its times. And the crisis was American in origin, coming to France on the heels of the divisive Marshall Plan, and in the realm of cinema, the Bloom-Burns Accord, which dismantled local protections against the Hollywood juggernaut. And Hollywood needed Europe because following the 1948 Paramount divestiture decree, it suddenly, uh, the major studios lost their exhibition wing. Theaters now were at liberty to book films as they chose. A free-for-all ensued, exactly the moment for entrepreneurs to come up with attention-grabbing schemes. The evidence of this is all over the pages of American newspaper ads after 1950, promising spectacles never before seen on screen while upstart distributors flirted with censorship as they promoted risque movies from Germany, Sweden, or Italy. Uh, I don't know if anybody here remembers uh, a person even louder and more obstreperous than Michael McGee was Calvin Prylock. He was a graduate student, but an older one. And he uh, brought this to our attention uh, 
at a PhD seminar in 1979 or so. He wrote a, he gave a very fine paper, the only one he wrote that was fine as far as I'm concerned, but uh, on uh, on block on the blockbuster, the notion of it and how it, how it operated. I had never really seen it laid out that well before. The usually fiscally conservative studios bec uh, at this moment, 1950, 48 to 50, turned their engineers loose, ready to gamble on the format of cinema itself, because they understood that given their tremendous advantage in capital, they could still control exhibition after altering its format. They could just scorch the world and then come up. They would still be alive after everything changed. Why not make mo movies gargantuan? Why not surround spectators with stereo sound and even put them in the midst of images projected in 3D? Already lagging behind Hollywood in color, all other producers would take years to catch up to these new technologies. Of course, Hollywood also had the nightmare of television in view. A minor threat in 1948, I think maybe we, you can tell me, uh, I'm not a TV person, but I'm talking about it here, but my reading is that there were only 50,000 sets in operation in 1948, 80% of them on the East Coast. But TV was growing ex exponentially in the U.S. as an inevitable rival for the affection of the mass audiences. And against television's convenient, low-cost home viewing, Hollywood realized it better offer increased spectacle. And so after years of, of low metabolism in their research and development departments, new inventions suddenly rolled out of the labs. With, with predictable fanfare, Hollywood promised to renew not just the movies, but the whole cinema experience. Now, Bazan traveled twice uh, across the seas to South America, but he never came to the U.S. This meant that he surely missed elements and details that could have contributed to a larger and more accurate account of things. So he didn't monitor, for instance, something that I've always been fascinated in, uh, drive-in movie theaters, which were unknown before 1950, but grew to nearly a quarter of all screens in the United States by, uh, by the mid-60s, and which went on, uh, went head-to-head -head against TV to grab the newly mobile suburban audiences. You can only imagine his anatomy that the social phenomenon uh, would have undergone and his analysis of the genres that were projected on screens rising above enormous parking lots. But there was never a single drive-in that was built in France. There was one in Italy outside of Rome. I, haven't, I was looking into the, it's a really American phenomenon. Drive-ins would be difficult commodities to export overseas. They're just not easy to do. And also, they were developed by the seamier, disorganized exhibition wing of the film industry. And that's a whole other story. Uh, but movies and technology are much more readily exportable, and these are in the hands of producers and distributors. In its fight with TV, the major studios needed to expand to Europe and beyond, not just to amortize the cost of their research and development units, but to pay for the greater expense of the movies made in those formats, including the ballooning publicity costs. When you bring out a blockbuster, you have to actually spend a lot of money on advertising it. So there were elaborate campaigns preparing the way for premieres of new formats at film festivals and in key theaters in many European metropolises. Bazan had a front row seat to watch Hollywood's gaudy response to, to the TV crisis. But he was never really in broadcast range of American television. He couldn't see it. Uh, of course, his deep concern lay not with America, but with the effects of its in entertainment war on standard cinema the world over. Now, what about the future of TV in France? That was on his mind. For better or worse, it lagged well behind the United States and operated under complete governmental supervision. What ought it to look like, and how might it affect French cinema? Might there be a Parisian, a Parisian entertainment war as well? A very large readership followed his articles with mixed historical information. He had technical explanations. He had aesthetic speculation and cultural opinion. He was certainly expected to pronounce on the quality of what was available on TV, but he was reluctant to pummel the very first efforts of any new forum because bearing a kind of, he, he had the attitude of an evolutionary scientist, and he was, so he was fascinated by all early expressions emerging from new cultural configurations, including those that are likely to fail to develop. He wanted to give it the benefit of, his doubt, of the doubt. Bazin never questioned evolution. He accepted not just Darwin on the biological species, but Andre Malraux on the arts. Having experienced his first talkie when he was 12, he facetiously entertained the notion that the cinema was maturing at about the rate of a human being, a bit slower than himself, let's say. <laughs> so after World War II, it was striving mightily to achieve adulthood, being pulled this way and that by hormones and social pressures that it scarcely understood. This was nothing like the traditional arts, such as painting and theater, 
which took, took millennia to arrive at consistent genres. Traditional arts uh, we, we were born with human civilization, um, and they are going to expire with it, he would say. Nothing in between will, um, will stop it. They may reach certain high points, we call them classical periods, and they have to undergo certain historical vicissitudes that may weaken them for a time, but you can count on their survival, theater, painting, poetry, uh, as long as there are people around who care about words or stories or drawing or playing games of imitation like charades, you're going to get theater. By contrast, there's nothing natural at all about the technological arts, he said, and these began only to appear in the 19th century. Aimed at mass culture, their paramount value must be measured far more by their social function than by their aesthetic achievement. Now, cinema, clearly the most potent art of the 20th century, has an amazing capacity to capture and express and process contemporary experience, even if, on the formal level, as an art, it could hardly be expected to reach the depth or the significance of its noble predecessors. Nobody should denigrate cinema if, in its first decades, a very large part of celluloid and projection time was given over simply to providing things on screen that people cared to see conveniently, such as boxing matches or variety acts or stage plays, even exotic places and peoples. Yes, there were original concoctions on film, including the adaptations of novels, and these amount to a kind of sur cinematic surplus, so to speak. Cinema was only a half century old when Be uh, Bazin began his career as critic. And genuinely innovative filmmaking could not be expected to often reach the level of sophistication that is routine in the, in the other arts. But by the 1950s, Bazan believed that the most advanced cinema had taken on its shoulders the concerns and the sensibility of the period, sharing these especially with the novel, which he thought was the most dynamic art form going, that really, where you really had give and take with people who were for forming culture. He thought the cinema had just about reached that level. No matter what your assessment of the traditional arts might be in the post-war era, and he knew there were avant-garde things going on, action painting in the US, theater the absurd right under his nose in Paris with Ionesco and Genet and Beckett, the Nouveau Roman, Rogrier and Natalie Surratt were writing just then. He knew these, they, they were causing a stir. But you had to credit the most ambitious post-war films as operating in the same cultural terrain as painting, theater, and the novel. Cinema, in other words, had evolved to a point where it deserved the high-flown attention that Bazin and others were according it in the Nouvelle Observateur, or even that Sartre was giving it in Les Temps Modernes, and it, was, it, was, it had become, it had arrived. Still, it was an industrial art. He never forgot that, and his actual disciples at Cahiers de Cinema uh, really didn't like the fact that he stressed this as much as he did, because it's subject to technological and economic forces that mock an idealist notion of aesthetic evolution. Bazan even writes fondly about Hollywood. Uh, he realizes how terribly vulnerable it is, even though it, it, it brashly puffs out its chest. He imagines that there could easily be a crisis uh, or a miracle in the world of economics and technology that could extinguish Hollywood and cinema in toto, or more likely change it in, into some new medium scarcely recognizable in his generation of critics. Never sentimental, Bazan will not retreat to some notion of pure cinema, impervious to the marketplace. He may personally have looked forward to the more arty films. He estimated them at less than 5% of the, uh, they're kind of leading edge, let's say, of the March each year of 3,000 or so are mov movies that are made annually, were made at that time. In fact, 3,000 is a pretty good number from 1930 to about 1990. <laughs> about 3,000 films a year made worldwide. He says maybe 5% or f fewer are really, they're the leading edge, the art cinema. But cinema depends on its being a world phenomenon and a mass art. And to him, this really was non-negotiable. As much as he hated to admit it, cinema depends on economic and political concerns that are indifferent or even hostile to art. This was patently true of French television. And he watched it wriggle to life try to survive in the harshest of incubators, a, a cold front having drifted over the Atlantic from Hollywood and its entertainment wars. The hastily staged homegrown programming that he followed nightly on the single ORTF station provided him a stream of ideas about media as a whole, about the unpredictability of their evolution. He wanted TV to succeed, but he knew it could do so only under terms that were never really its own.
Now, there's a section in Sartre's uh, great book, uh, L'Imaginaire, which, uh, which Bazin uh, owned a personal copy of, and it's called The Family of Images. Sartre distinguishes that. Uh, he, in that he's trying to distinguish painting from, from other kinds of images, and he talks about memories, caricatures, hallucinations, hypnagogic images. He calls this the family of images, and Bazin explicitly added, he wrote in, an, uh, in a note in there, uh, f what about photos, films, and broadcast television? He's, he's writing about this in the 40s. This is television being the newborn baby of this family of images. Now, whereas cinema inevitably projects images that, la that lag days, weeks, or years behind the moment when they were recorded, television can be said to, be to depend on the liveness of present perception. All viewers reached by a broadcast participate simultaneously at one and the same event. This essential difference may have become smudged over the decades since institution, the institution of television increasingly replays events recorded earlier, and in our day it's really hard to understand how, these, how to parse this out. But in the 1950s, entire movies, uh, even in the 1950s, entire movies could often show up on TV. But he said, look at the coronation of Elizabeth in 1952. That should attest uh, to its liveness, as well as the routine of sports matches, nightly news, and in our day, we just saw the Olympics. Tomorrow night, you'll see the Oscars. I'll be stuck in a snowstorm in an airport. Uh, <laughs> And other live broadcasts, all these suggest that TV is essentially distinct from cinema. And Bazin's philosophy of the image can, can be found within that distinction. We have to be careful. He was not prepared to pronounce on the essence of cinema, let alone television, or to come too quickly to a definition of télégénie, equivalent to photogénie, which is a big word that the French uh, came, uh, pounced on in the 1920s and rhapsodized about something very special about cinema. There is a, a photogénie. Uh, and Bazin mocked that, really. Indeed, TV let him recognize the instability that's also a permanent state in cinema, though to a lesser degree. All new technologies, and he used the term new technologies, need time to develop and steady themselves since their forms could still be in flux and their social functions had hardly been tested. Because television was effectively starting from scratch, we shouldn't imagine, or excuse me, we shouldn't immediately impugn its chances eventually to contribute to intellectual culture in the manner of the other arts. After all, the pundits of 1908, he said, had ridiculed cinema for its baby talk, and they had to eat their words twice first in the 1920s during the efflorescence of the silent screen, and then more recently when sound cinema, against all prognosis, had proved the cineast to be the equal of the novelist in, in his formulation. So might the same not be true a few decades hence with regard to TV? Actually, Bazin wasn't sure. He claimed that the priority of utility over expressive creativity was evident in radio, a medium that he was quite fond of, but which he took to be, in the main, a site where you encounter creativity produced elsewhere, more like an orchestra, ha uh, orchestra hall than an orchestra. The same was surely true of TV, even with the addition of the visual dimension, because at the time he wrote, when French TV was limited to a single channel, this hampered the experimentation and the competition that gave radio at least an, a range of avenues to, to explore. Bazin, who scoffed at the 20s refrain, ça c'est du cinéma, that's really cinema, which people used to say, ah, ça c'est du cinéma, he rebuked anybody that was ready to say, ça c'est de la télévision. So approaching television as he did all phenomena through its evolution, Bazin predicted an optimistic tale of development, but there would be no instant gratification. You can't expect TV to achieve eloquence and maturity in a decade if it took cinema half a century to do so. Indeed, for this to happen, so completely would TV have to focus on a single avenue of progress that it would sacrifice other possible aesthetic and social roots. He didn't mind seeing it drift, in fact. Actually, it wasn't drifting enough to suit him. Because operating on a single channel, that was immediate, an immediate impediment. And there was another impediment. It was technology itself, technology which actually works against the future that it lays before us. Every technological invention seems futuristic when it first appears, but its bulky machinery then weighs down its flight. Just look at cinema. Its advances have been minuscule given the amazing changes that have, occur have occurred in the civilization since its invention, like automobiles and airplanes. He couldn't believe that things had happened so slowly that 
He was shocked in 1952 to be, watch, to be watching two-hour feature films just the way his parents did in 1918, the year of his birth. What had changed? Well, where are the innovations that science has made in other spheres? His favorite whipping boy among all this is Thomas Edison, whose quite arbitrary choice of 35 millimeter as the standard gauge has hampered the development of larger gauges that might have genuinely improved exhibition. Except for sound, film lo films look and act very much the way they had for decades. He also repeatedly mentions the retardation by a quarter century of Henri Chrétien's 1926 anamorphic uh, lens for cinemascope, as well as the squelching of Abel Gantz's three-screen polyvision, and the fact that a variable-shaped sh variable screen, something that Eisenstein proposed in his essay, The Dynamic Square, and that Bazin actually supported, was unfeasible. Why is it unfeasible, he said? Well, it's not just because of capitalism. There are obvious reasons why, and he already went into that, things were going fine for the studios, no reason to bring out these inventions that are lying around waiting to be used until television comes along and suddenly we need spectacle. So let's go for 3D, let's go for CinemaScope, let's go for uh, stereo sound. Many people were saying, Capitalists have done it. He says, Wait, what about the Soviets? They've shown no interest in implementing what inventors had already come up with. Technological status quo is, he said, the default of every mass industry, and it certainly was, was a drag on cinema for decades. Once the world's 30,000 screens had been outfitted for sound, once thousands of exhibitors and projectionists had grown accustomed to their routine, then even excellent supplements would have a terrible time making a go of it including the one process that had some economic punch behind it, Technicolor. He was fatalistic and disappointed about the mediocre color and the, th and the med really mediocre 3D processes that won out in the 1950s after having taken so long to be implemented at all. Exhibitors generally forced the cheaper and the more convenient solution on all of these to all of these um, possibilities. And so we didn't get the best look of things. We just got the one that was going to be uh, simplest to roll out. So just as Edison's sacrosanct 35 millimeter standard seems to have doomed the su uh, superior uh, systems like VistaVision, so TV is almost certainly stuck with the mere 625 lines, that was the European standard, 525, I guess, in the US, uh, that were mandated for it in 1938, which was also arbitrary and which reigned forever. He said. Uh, he said, well, I've, I know that they're working on a 2,000-line version, and it's making a lot of progress. But if it were to be suddenly available tomorrow, it would still not be implemented because, and this is a quote, it would make obsolete all the current broadcasting and receiving equipment, all those little sets. From this perspective, it is reasonable to think that TV as we know it will last for a, quite a long time, just the way it is, except plausibly for the standardization of color a transition that I predict will be smooth and it will not overturn TV any more radically than it did cinema." Unquote. Well, things have changed, but it, he was right. For a really long time, TV just settled into what it was, and it didn't have to settle in that way. In sum, while Bazin was reluctant to essentialize TV, he did de detect a kind of provisional essence because for the foreseeable future, its possibilities would be limited by the particular hardware in place everywhere as well as by strict institutional conditions. These changed. There was a single channel in France financed by state agency. There were three networks in the U.S. financed by advertising. But effectively, you have um, parallel but quasi-essences. In both countries, and surely everywhere until the cable era, television was promoted as a friendly medium, a domestic one. So that would be one of its provisional essences, he said. Uh, and we learned a lot about that yesterday the domesticity of it. Its size, its familiar position in the living room, and its utility in providing news and weather, not to mention the friendly voice of an attractive speakerine in France, the woman who uh, tells you what's going to be on the programming. Uh, this distinguishes it from the adventure of going out and paying for something that promised to be extraordinary at the movie theater. Bazan wrote often of TV as the replacement for the hearth around which the family gathers to be warm and comfortable while they glance sometimes at each other, but uh, mainly at images that have been scrupulously cleansed of anything that could pose a threat to stability. Now more crucial to Bazan than this social function was TV's genuinely universal aesthetic difference from cinema. Its default tense is the present tense. 
Television addresses every viewer within its broadcast range in the now, no matter where they are. He couldn't get over the fact that a science program that he watched allowed him to see through a telescope the very moon whose light was streaming at that moment through the window that was right next to the TV. He talks about rotating his chair from TV to window to verify that it was the same object in its current phase. Characteristically, he quipped that the moon and stars were not really quite present since they are available to us only via a more, via a more primary medium, light, which takes its own time. The stars we see on TV or out our window are really no longer quite there where we see them. Bazan relished the drama and, and, and the risks that live broadcasts undertook. There was a particularly daring TV science program that showed the exploration of a diseased lung in real time through an invasive bronchial procedure. Actually, this was uh, overseen by Jean Panlevé, the experimental avant-garde surrealist, quasi-surrealist uh, filmmaker who was a friend of Bazan's, and he made this TV program. Uh, well, Bazan says, well, what if something goes wrong as, while we're watching? In cinema, what might have gone wrong on the shoot had been eliminated. Maybe even the patient had been eliminated. We won't know. Uh, you know, there would be a take two. <laughs> Not so on, li uh, on live TV, where we suffer now with those who suffer now and where we share some of the patient's marvel at looking at his own lung at the very moment that it's keeping him alive. So let me repeat, Bazan is not a purist. As radio had demonstrated prodigiously, pre-recorded material can often enhance a live broadcast. They can be mixed. But Bazan cautioned that it ought to be, re uh, anything pre-recorded ought to be recorded in live conditions so that its more, its more finished style wouldn't clash with the roughness of the live portion, which at least in the first years he took to be TV's baseline, in which he turns out he had a taste for. Hence he came down hard on that astronomy program I just mentioned, showing the moon uh, through the telescope, because a, l a bit later in the same program it intercalated images of a couple of planets that had clearly been taken earlier all the while pretending that the on-camera astronomer had just swiveled his telescope. TV owes it to the public, he said. Uh, it should provide an attestation about the status, the tense, he would call it, of what is being sent out and always received in the present. I guess we, we, we require that sometimes on television. This is pre-recorded. Are the Olympic, did you just watch the Olympic gold medal being won or did that happen five hours ago? These issues arise most frequently in teleplays, the medium's most ambitious genre and the one he kept up with closely. If TV were going to become an art, everybody assumed that it would be through the creative adaptation of good theater or through original dramas written for it. Bazan investigated this hope by keeping cinema and the stage as reference points. He kind of triangulated TV, cinema, and the, uh, the stage. So, ontologically, it, TV is a hybrid. A broadcast teleplay delivers at least some of the selected perspectives and shot changes that are available to cinema, but it does so in real time, as if you had just gone and seen a play at, the, uh, at a legitimate theater. He writes about British experiments with four cameras that permit the switching of points of view within pure continuity. Now, the TV switcher is completely different from the film editor who assembles an illusion of continuity from fragments. If pre-recorded segments are called for by the script, let's say, or, or, or by a particularly audacious director, these can be carefully intercalated, but spatial contiguity should be maintained. He applauded this strategy in one uh, play adapted for TV that took place uh, in a, a sailor's dive by a wharf. The set and dialogue implied that there was a barge presumably docked just outside. Scenes in the barge were pre-recorded on film, and they unrolled seamlessly after having been cued by the movement of the actors as they walked off the bar, off the bar set. They, that's moved straight into the film portion on the barge that preserved continuity. This gave the actors and the TV cameraman a few minutes break before action resumed back on the live set. Now this program can exist only in the single, unbroken, 90-minute block of t uh, television time. It was not a movie that could be shown again, and it was more than a play since its action extended outside beyond the wings of the stage. In Bazan's rather conservative appraisal, there are limits to this, however. 
for instance, it would not have done to cut to some scene or set that was, that was far off in the city. The film barge should really serve as a contiguous extension of the barroom stage setting. Bazan wondered how TV actors hold up without playing to the audiences the way they do in the theater. Of course, there's a public, but it exists as a statistical sum of individuals watching at the same moment, but in ignorance of one another, and definitely in ignorance of the, the actors. The actors, in fact, perform before what is only a cold eye of one or several lenses that are fixed to television cameras. What if they slip up? At the theater, they can be prompted by a complicit member sitting somewhere in the first rows. But on TV, they are naked and alone. This accounts for the double chagrin that he claims he, he often feels when, especially in the first years of TV dramas, slip-ups were, were quite common. He felt ashamed for the actor, but also for his own impotence. At the cinema, by contrast, the editor restores everyone's potency simply by inserting take two. Uh, a well-made film is hermetic, something we admire without knowing, uh, without its knowing that we are there. This is Stanley Cavell's central insight, uh, cueing the title to his book, The World Viewed. Meanwhile, a TV program, even a very well-made one, shamelessly addresses an invisible public without whose experience and memory it evaporates when the half hour is up. Hence, TV's often ingratiating address to spectators that it can't be sure are attentive or even there. Nightly newscasts and variety acts, which are the staples of early TV, clinch this realization, and still do, where they talk right to us, right to our faces, unlike on television. Now, some variety shows on television include an audience whom we hear applaud and occasionally see, a diegetic audience, something that's really there. The TV spect spectator can be given the role of a witness or kind of invited guest to look on while the event unfolds. In one of his most endearing pieces, Bazan marvels at being invited, like everybody else who tuned in, to a swanky Parisian charity soiree that included famous people among its real-life guests. Among the celebrities attending was Charlie Chaplin. Bazan was doubly pleased to be in front of his TV, first because he was present for an occasion the likes of which he had heard about all his life and now could witness without uh, donning a tuxedo, and second, because once the variety acts began that were the announced spectacle of the evening, he was able to enjoy not just the jugglers and the singers, but the reactions of the attendees. The payoff came when the producer occasionally would switch cameras to focus on the guests rather than on the perf performances that they were watching. And the high point of the broadcast was something that not even the most distinguished guest that was there could see. That is, Chaplin reacting to the mediocre routine of a clown hired to entertain him, actually hired to entertain the, the whole world. And Bazan just loved watching Chaplin react to somebody who was trying to do something like Chaplin. Now, television interpolates or, or summons each individual viewer through its chief psychological draw, which is intimacy, the opposite of spectacle in his view. In America, Viewers feel the personal solicitations of advertisers ingratiatingly trying to bring us in. In France, interpolation is evident each time the speakerine talks to you through the uh, talks you through the evening's lineup of shows. Bazan found her to be the prow of the ship of television that crews straight into your living room to greet you and to expect a greeting in return. He writes uh, remarkably about the three speakerines that were dominant in this period and gives them, knows all about their private lives and, uh, and knows enough to, to tell you what, that we are interested in their private lives and that they're kind of interested in ours or pretend to be. Uh, so he recalls having uh, restrained himself from going up to TV personalities that he would in encounter haphazardly on the Paris streets because he felt they had become friends and that his greeting was a necessary courtesy. This has nothing to do with the fandom that cinema fosters. It's very different, he says. The small screen's familiarity makes it friendly and democratic. And Bazan appraised a specific television reportage on peasants that he had anticipated would be very dull, because peasants, he said, are by profession and habit neither, lo neither loquacious nor, nor eloquent. But listening to them for 30 minutes gave him insights into their work and their social values that he had never before considered. And more important, he liked these men and he felt connected to them. In its first years, television occasionally provided a glimpse of the new forms of social understanding and cohesion it is capable of fostering. 
Still, TV is endemically national. Would Bazin have felt as comfortable inviting into his home some peasants from China, or more problematic for France at the time, from Indochina? He doesn't say. But TV is really about the local community, or as far as the broadcast can reach. It's linguistically, it's monolingual. Still, his point was really about the immediacy of meeting these French peasants in real time, knowing that they were breathing and talking right then on the other side of the TV set. This never failed to stir his, uh, his admiration. He wrote, what counts for the spectator is not so much what he sees, but the fact that he sees it then. What counts is la présence. That's why Bazin was seldom bored in front of the TV uh, unless it w tried to overreach itself and kind of make cinema <laughs> do something arty. He loved interview shows where a single person would hold forth without a cutaway and simply address the spectator in dialogue with a proxy host who asks the questions. An author, he talks about an author presenting a book, let's say, or a police commissioner simply talking about his efforts in the community. Sure, he says, you might be find more excitement if you ran off to the cinema to see a movie adapted from that novelist or a gangster film dramatizing this police, the police procedures this guy is talking about. But if you really had the novelist or the commissioner coming over for dinner, don't you think you'd rather stay home and listen to their genuine voices and stories instead? If TV can bring such people into your homes, well, go to the movies another day and enjoy their presence now. They're right there. Be with them. Such hopes for a virtual community of telespectators suggests an ethical dimension that Bazan believed could have a salutary rebound effect on the new medium's big brother, cinema. So when he trumpeted Sidney Lumet's film, 12 Angry Men, for taking the Golden Bear at Berlin in 1957, he immediately pointed out that as good as Henry Fonda was, his performance had already been trumped de facto by Robert Cummings, who originated that role in the 1954 live TV teleplay, which Bazin couldn't see, and which actually nobody could see until about four years ago when uh, a the uh, kine was discovered in New York in a New York apartment. He didn't care how good it was. He just said the fact that Cummings could do this live m made him made it more interesting. Bazan ruminated that TV might be the perfect vehicle for a script. If you remember Twelve Angry Men, <laughs> that turns individual viewers into jurors, addressed by lawyers, a judge, and witnesses, and then by other jurors. You ought to watch it at home alone, he says, where you are forced to make up your own mind about the situation and on the spot without the moral comfort of a crowded movie theater. Of course, he was glad that the film had been made, for it bucked the trend of technological bravura and all the other spectacle films. It was a smaller film. It attested to the enduring appeal of black and white dramas. Indeed, TV's ever-growing audience enticed several top-level filmmakers to work on smaller subjects than usual and to experiment with a direct approach, as in the first years of neorealism. Hitchcock, he loved the fact that Hitchcock, he interviewed Hitchcock and Rossellini, and, oh, and uh, he was very interested in many American filmmakers that uh, went to work in, in television. And he said, well, they, they can experiment more. Take a smaller subject, take chances, which, and he was upset that the French hadn't done that very much. Jacques Rivette, his protege, shouted Eureka when he saw Roberto Rossellini's film Voyage to Italy in 1954. Rivette said, I have just made a discovery. There is a television aesthetic, and this aesthetic is what I'm beginning, uh, what, I'm be what it is beginning to be. I just learned recently from an article by Andre Bazin. Rossellini's films, though film, are also subject to this direct aesthetic with, with with all it comprises of gamble, tension, chance, and providence. Rivette also characterizes this film as a, like a sketch by Matisse or an essay by Montaigne or Gide, or I would add uh, Alain, the tremendously popular French philosopher of the early years of the 20s. Alain wrote these two-page essays every night. He wrote over 2,000 of them. Uh, and it's claimed that he wrote them always at one sitting with no recourse to rewriting or crossing out or editing, just the forward movement of a continuous idea. That's the, that's the notion of the sketch. It's also the notion of the direct. This is continuity. This is TV aesthetic for Bazin. And they felt it in Rossellini's film, Voyage to Italy with Ingrid Bergman in 1954. Now, the TV genre that shares most with Rossellini's film, 
was the Social Problem Program, the slice-of-life drama shot in a single location over a brief period of time. Patty Chayefsky was the master of this form. Bazan didn't like Marty, it turns out, but he found it way too melodramatic and overrated. But he, liked, he understood Chayefsky's power. In France, Marcel Moussy was the best writer working in this vein. He produced a series of engaging TV programs about juvenile delinquents called Si C'était Vous, uh, If It Were You, What Would You, what would you Do? Uh, when Bazin interviewed him at length in Cahiers du Cinema in 1958, just a month before he died, Bazin died actually, Moussi declared TV to be the neo-realist medium par excellence. I suppose he was thinking of the way that live situations usually involve dead period, uh, periods of dead time. Moussi also left his own dramas open at the end, after an hour's meandering had set in mo uh, that had been set in motion by some specific premise. He looked for material that could be performed by citizens acting just as they were on screen. He wanted each individual viewer to face up to a moral quandary that the writer had, hadn't rigged and whose solution wasn't obvious. Now, Bazan conducted this interview just as Moussi was putting in the final touches in the script he prepared for Francois Truffaut, Bazin, Bazin's adopted son. The title of that film, The 400 Blows a film famous for featuring an ordinary boy playing something just like himself, improvising an encounter on direct, indirect, with a psychologist and running toward the beach before turning back to look at the director and at us in perhaps the most famous open-ended ending in the history of cinema. In an off-sided moment of pathos uh, or comic irony, Bazan died the very first day that 400 Blows was in production. He died on the eve of the new wave which would, among other things, make good his belief that television could rejuvenate French cinema. TV, thanks to its speed, its improvisation, and its sheer presentness, had administered a shock en retour, a rebound effect, that kicked French cinema into an adventure of risk and frankness. The boldest contributors to frankness and risk of the new wave were the ethnographic cineast Jean Rouge and the sociologist Edgar Morin. Bazin knew both of them, especially uh, Morin, whom he admired. And Morin penned a beautiful el um, eulogy for Bazin in 1959. Now, the following year, 1960, everybody heard about Rouge and Morin because they collaborated on the first feature that went under the rubric Cinema Verite. In France, it was known as uh, direct cinema drawing on ideas that Bazan had promulgated all decade long concerning direct TV. <laughs> Not the product, but his own sense. That next year, Moran and Roland Bart founded a journal that became a touchstone for me when I got to Iowa. Its name, Communications. Somehow, when pronounced with a French accent, as it should be, Communication, it seemed entirely acceptable to me. <laughs> Indeed, it was cutting edge. <laughs> something to use against the status quo. I used to cite it against McGee. Uh, this is where Roland Barthes wrote. This is where uh, uh, many of the great uh, aestheticians, Christian Metz wrote. Uh, I confess it never crossed my mind, never crossed my mind that the status quo represented by my father and especially by Sam Becker were involved in exactly the same enterprise, communications. Had I realized this, there would have been less miscommunication or missed communication. More to the point, what I've been trying to communicate to you is how much I miss that miscommunication that I shared actually very productively with Sam. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Okay, there's something kind of perverse about getting to say this after this talk. Those following us online can tweet questions to hashtag BeckerCon14. But are there any questions in the audience right now for Dudley? Hi, thank you for that um, talk. So I was really struck by, because I've heard you talk about Bazan, I've read your Bazan book before. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So um, I was really struck by Bazan's um, interest in liveness, obviously. And you say he hadn't really seen many US TV programs. I guess he had seen Marty. But um, because US critics were so invested in liveness as well, 
and as was Raymond Williams. I wondered if he had any, there was any um, circuitry of criticism going on where he would have known what a critic like Jack Gold of the New York Times or Raymond Williams and the listener were talking about since some of what he's saying seems to repeat that but they're speaking against different traditions like for the US critics at least the prominent ones it's theater which is the medium that they're speaking to and that TV is supposed to kind of be in dialogue with. I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that even if Bazan didn't talk directly to them if you could say anything about that? I really can say very little. It's a uh, important, really important point. Uh, there were, as far as I know, no congresses of television, international congresses. Um, there might have been some in Europe, but I don't know of them. I, the names, these names do not crop up in any of his writings that I've, and I've looked at, I think, everything he's written on television. Uh, and he doesn't write about other critics. Uh, it's as if he's encountering them uh, as I say, he begins in his sick bed. Just he sees what's on TV, he thinks about it, and he writes about it. Maybe the issues of television are fairly transparent if you think very deeply about it. These guys are really smart, the ones you've mentioned, especially Williams. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that they come up with some of the same issues and the same vocabulary. But um, he didn't read English much. Um, he, he usually waited for things in translation, and I don't know if he would have gotten uh, the periodicals. Where did Williams write? Uh, where would he have written these? Okay, um, I don't think he would have encountered this uh, particularly. And unless those guys came to film, he went to a lot of film festivals uh, where they talked cinema, people talked cinema. And maybe there would be subsections of those f film festivals that would be about television, the way we, you know, some small subgroup would go off and meet over the five days of a film festival to talk about issues on television and he would find out what's going on in other countries and how they were being, how TV was being discussed. But I never saw any evidence of this at all. Other questions? Well, I have one if no one's going to raise their hand right away. So following up on this last question, um, since Williams wrote about TV operating as a block of time, could you maybe clarify a little bit what an evening or a week's worth of programming would kind of look like on French television. I guess mm -hmm. I have a sense of there being these kind of experimental, the Pan Levé surgery program, which sounds right. amazing. But what would a, a kind of night of programming Good. look like for Bazan? Yeah, well, I looked, uh, I should have actually Xeroxed some of those. Um, it's actually very simple to find out there's less going on on television than there is in cinema by far. Uh, things usually start at two in the afternoon, and there are, uh, are a couple of uh, little uh, dramas. Uh, and, but when at prime time there were uh, oh I, I had a list of exact he had he parsed out exactly what percentage of time was devoted to each subcategory of programming and they tried the ORTF tried to uh, he thought admirably reach all sectors of the populace so there were children's shows uh, there was adult entertainment that he some of which. Uh, ought to involve censorship, he said. I think things were uh, wilder in France than they were allowed to be here. Um, there were usually three full each full full length feature films shown per week. I would say, uh, you know, some night at the cinema. There were quite a few uh, films, uh, TV shows that were kind of higher level. I guess we would call them uh, public TV type shows. For instance, Lecture pour tous, where uh, a very important guy would bring on authors and talk to them about their writings. Uh, there was a science show uh, that was on for uh, maybe once a week. Uh, and there was uh, Tonight at the Theater. There were quite a few variety shows, television. This is the same as in the US, I think. Uh, it was a very simple format to be able to reproduce, because it's stagey, it's staged, and uh, you have people just performing for an audience. Um, so uh, variety account accounted for quite a lot of it. There was the opera and some classical music that was performed um, a couple of times per week. So there were, uh, you got your dose of high culture and he actually calculated that it, he thought it was a, a decent dose if you watched it carefully. And there was more than the lecture pour tous. There was one other, uh, you know, where people would get pundits on to talk about recent events, uh, current events and news, news, newsworthy events in, um, in politics. There was uh, debate, uh, television debates, uh, talk, and when it came time for elections, um, 
so they had, it was a pretty good range of things, and they had it pretty well parsed out uh, a certain percentage per, um, per week. It was done by the week rather than by the day. Uh, something you just said made me think, and, and if you mentioned this in the talk, uh, I didn't catch it. Um, did Bazan ponder the significance of watching movies, watching cinema on television? Yeah. Um, and I, I'm thinking of the way in which um, increasingly some, some, you know, once we started thinking about the history of film studies in the last couple of years, a number of people, including one of your former students, Chris Keithley, have written about the uh, the significance of old films being shown on television as a kind of repertory mm -hmm. so that you could you could learn the history of cinema that way when films were not available. Now for Bazan a lot of films are obvious old films are available in cinemas but I wonder if he's he's thinking about what yeah. it means to watch a movie through television. Yeah he does. He has several articles about this. Uh, one of them is about uh, Le Petit Marchand d'Allumette, the little match girl of Renoir. He says some films are better on the small screen than the big screen. Uh, and then he has one about the uh, magnificent uh, opportunity that we have to replay the entire history of cinema uh, from our, in, in our living room, just watching films that we hadn't seen in a long time or not knowing that they were there. And sometimes this had to do with the happenstance of what uh, libraries the television was able to access. So all of those issues that are still with us today, uh, he came up against and talked about them um, uh, quite a lot. They didn't have. They didn't break up TV, TV films with uh, advertisements, so you could see the entire film. Sometimes there was a whole screen uh, show run by Marcel Herbier uh, that he, where he would introduce the f old film and have somebody on there. So they were already doing kind of cinematech um, screenings, television screenings that were uh, that he found generally quite good. He liked them a lot. So yeah, that was that was important. That's just to elaborate on that. So was there a degree of liveness in the replaying? So in, in some ways, there's a zero degree of liveness. So it becomes the history itself is being performed alongside. History of cinema is being performed alongside with cinema itself. And I was wondering about the liveness effect when it thins to the point where it looks like it's live, but it's really the liveness itself that you're watching. Right. Well, just, uh, just the L'Herbier show is the only one that we're people would comment on the show itself. Uh, I'm trying to remember, there, he may have had one instance where he talks about the, uh, the reformatting of a film to fit the TV screen that he doesn't, you know, just many of the normal things that, we, that bother us about, aha, you're seeing this now, but had you been there, it would have been otherwise. So you can get some sense of the time break between the two. Uh, oh, thank you for that fine talk. Uh, just to get some implications of this out, uh, the phenomenon of cinema and its relationship to the medium of film uh, what's that what's the tense of that if the tense of tv is present and uh, secondly uh, when you have the new wave in italian realism does that change the, the tense of film oh no no this is my this is my stuff uh. <laughs> and then the third thing is when you have digitized film is it film <laughs> Turn around to Garrett Stewart and ask him. Uh, <laughs> um, he's written on that. I th yes, I think that uh, cinema has a very um, a unique uh, temporal status that I think makes it, for me, uh, different from any other experience in the one that I prefer. It has what I call a, a lag, a lag time. And you're always in two times. I call it jet lag. Um, and you're, you go to the movies, you think you're seeing something that came before, but it looks like it's present. And so you're, you're both experiencing something with a character that you're, as Sartre says, you're walking into the future with a character on the screen, and yet you know it was taken some time in, in the past. Um, and so the, the hesitation between the two is, uh, gives you an eerie feeling of being both present and past, and that, that's an experience that I, I get in jet lag. In some, I'm in two sp times at the same time, and it gives you some space for I think uh, reflection or for rebounding effect, which I don't find in other, other media, including uh, live television or at the theater. And he, he preferred it to the theater. Uh, it's, it's more personal. It's kind of a strange existential state that um, uh, is its own. It's, it's different from photographs, which are in the past, he says. But TV is both in the past and in the present. So. All right, we've got time for one or two more very quick questions. I have three things, and you're welcome to comment on one that you're interested in, maybe. <laughs> one of them is the American 
crisis like that the U.S. causes and the reflection of any uh, in Bazin's work on any threat from the United States to the culture of France or something. The second one is you said that uh, in his work it seems like television is ra or um, that cinema ha uh, is raising issues for people to consider. And it seems like for television researchers, television as a cultural forum sort of does that. And I wonder whether that's the same thing. And then the last one is really just kind of an, an industry question. Before television in the United States could become an archive for cinema, Hollywood had to allow that. And for, for a while there, they were not sure. And they would not let movies shown on television. And in France, was that different? OK, so no, very uh, good. I have answers to them. Um, the f uh, if I can remember them all. Uh, the first question about um, Bazin's sense, yeah, he felt that he was very much in favor of what he heard about American television, in part because of the labor situation. He was uh, in favor of the, he thought that the unions had a better chance of affecting American television than they did of affecting uh, American um, cinema. And he was a he was a very I would say he was an anti-American in terms of cinema. He was very he was afraid of what was what American television did to um, excuse me American cinema did to uh, France's own cinema and to f not just its cinema its populace but watching what he thought was manufactured idiocy for the most part. And he said this many times that uh, despite his love for certain American filmmakers and his. He really was opposed to uh, the dominance of American cinema and felt at the film festivals that Europe was, in fact, fighting back with film festivals in a way that was really courageous and important. And I think he believed that t American television was on their side uh, as, and it was more democratic. And he talked about where TVs came from and you know, he had studied some demographics uh, about American television's um, sets. The question of whether or not uh, uh, television could ever speak back to cinema. W was that your third question? In it was a uh, the cultural forum question, and then the just the industry response. Do, would the industry allow films on? TV oh yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, French television had a had an easier way to show to use. Uh, films than American. In fact, he even talks about, Marcel Moussy in this said they're able to actually bring, use stock footage shot in other movies in television plays, whereas in Hollywood he, he quoted some laws that said it was illegal to do so. So they, they had some advantages over the legal system uh, in the U.S., definitely. So. All right, we're going to have to actually wrap it up there. Let's talk to Dudley during the break. Thank you for the talk, and we'll see everyone back here for the next session. Thank you.